This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 25. It was this one moment, I'll tell you, that, that transformed Flip Learning to UDL is I had all the kids watch videos and that they, every kid had to watch the video. And then one girl was like, I really don't like your videos. I can't learn from your videos. And I was like, all right, well, what can I provide for her? And so she just, I literally just gave her some textbook pages. So nothing fancy by any means. But then it, the lesson was, all right, students, you guys can watch the video about, you know, digestive system, or you can read these pages. And then it just had this snowball effect. And I was like... Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. What's going on, everyone? This is Ken Ehrman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I am here, as always, with my co-host, Mr. Matt, the Decision Maker Rogers. Matt, we just came off an awesome episode. I was hogging the mic like crazy uh, because it is a topic that I'm, I'm super passionate about, but um, how are you feeling and, and what are your thoughts on what our listeners and viewers are going to get into with this episode? I think honestly, the what I took away was this conversation really circled around instructional methods that are simply best for kids. And when they're simply great for kids, then they are time worth doing, the, the effort's worth it. You at the end feel like you've achieved what your your end goal is, which is creating an experience where the most amount of kids get the most amount of learning um, out of their educational experience. And um, Kyle does an incredible job of talking about a structure. He's, he's definitely someone that has just worked tirelessly to figure out what that structure is to create organized environments where learners and kids can just really thrive within his topics it's really an incredible conversation yeah it i think it speaks to like you said the the work that he's put into it uh from the way he described it it was realizations on his own ideas on his own to only realize that there's like research behind it and there's methods behind it that he then found that was able to further enhance it i felt as though I was on a very similar journey to him to to get where I was as a classroom teacher. And it, it kind of taps into what I talked about in our, our kickoff to summer episode where, you know, use this time to reflect on the big picture and the big ideas. And Kyle paints the picture of the, the big idea of his classroom and the, the uh, balcony view structure as well as really diving into specific key instructional practices that he uses to deliver his instruction, to stay in touch with his kids, to emotionally stay in touch with his kids. Um, he gives he gives so many great ideas and it just speaks to the power of this podcast and 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 you know I, I talk about it in the episode. Like we don't script anything and we had no idea the conversation was gonna go the way it went. And uh, we just loved it. It was it was fantastic. So um, I kind of want to keep this intro short and sweet and just like jump right into this. Is there anything else that you want to share before we before we get to it? Yeah, the, the only thing that I would add is at the end of the day, what he he hits us out the gate with some really important concepts, but he, he talks heavily about the difference between flipped learning and flipped classroom, which I think is a huge kind of... Um, you may not think that it's a big deal, but it's a big deal, the difference. To to justify one compared to actually doing it authentically as well as universal design for learning, um, the idea of creating experiences where kids have um, flexibility and choice to an authentic beneficial level, um, too often we get caught up, and that's kind of the, Ken, why we're sitting here, because we really feel like we've been pushing through the glitz and the glamour 
to really get into the core meat and potatoes, the value of it all. So um, really, at, at the end of the day, I think it's an awesome episode that clarifies and also confirms why we act in certain ways we do, why we place effort where we do, um, and really, again, make the best experience possible for kids. Yeah, I 100% agree with that, and I really like uh, that you brought light to that. His definition between flip learning and flip classroom, I think, was really powerful. Something that I didn't even really think about, but I 100% agree with with the way he described that. So uh, we're not going to delay any further. We're going to bring in uh, Kyle Nemus. He's an educator from New Jersey, and uh, let's let's jump into his story and and what he's doing for for students and teachers on a daily basis. Hi, Kyle. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. We're super excited to have you here. How are you doing tonight? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So just start things off for us. Officially introduce yourself, where you're coming from, and what your your journey has looked like so far in education. Sure. So my name is Kyle Nemus. I was a seventh grade science teacher for 12 years, and now this is my third year as an ed tech coach. Um, and then next year, I'll be heading back into the classroom. And I am in New Jersey. I um, support teachers right now in South Brunswick. Um, and so how much, I mean, how much of my journey do you want to hear? Well, let's, let's, let's dig into the beginning. So Mr. Nemus, the, you said seventh grade science, Seventh uh, grade science. Yeah. what was, what was your classroom like, you know, maybe in, in year five to, to seven, when you were really hitting your groove and, and, and designing, you know, probably the best experiences that you had, what is, what did your class dynamic look like? You know, if we talk to one of your students, how would they describe your classroom? Um, yeah, I'm glad you said year five to seven, cause you're right. Those first couple of years where it's, I mean, even year five to seven, I feel like I look back and, and hopefully, right. Hopefully fast forward 10 years, I'll look back at these years and I'll be like, Oh my gosh, I thought I knew what I was doing at this point too. Um, so I will tell you my teaching style is a little bit different, a little bit unique, um, in the sense of, um, I, I do kind of a hybrid flipped learning style. I, I've, I've always said it's kind of like a flipped learning meets UDL. I don't know how comfortable you guys are with UDL and universal design for learning. You're um, speaking my language right now. Oh my goodness. So we're, I'm in the right, right spot then. Yeah. I was actually just, I was literally before I got on this podcast, sending a tweet out to Katie Novak, who's like the queen of UDL. Um, so man. Okay. So I will, I'll try not to go in. I'll, I'll go broad and you ask me as many questions as you want. So my classroom was very much, geared on student choice um and as a seventh grade student most students came into my classroom not really knowing how to choose their own adventure of how they want to learn they're kind of um used to being told do this and do that and um so a lot of my energy honestly was teaching them how to learn um and by choosing the things that they want and assessing them their own their selves as opposed to me telling them what's best for them so again a very udl so that's um, my passion was, was absolutely that I love students being able to learn that way and also hopefully come out enjoying science. Um, I always say, I feel like kids first, and then hopefully they learn some science along the way for the benefit of all our listeners and viewers. Can you very quickly just define UDL and then also define flip learning? And then I want to ask you a question about those two. Yeah, good question. Okay. So UDL, Universal Design for Learning. So I'm going to use uh, a Katie Novak analogy um, quickly. Don't worry. Um, but so it's always food analogies with me. So the way I, we always describe UDL and all the workshops, and I actually teach a grad class on UDL. And we always start off with this analogy that like, um, it's almost like a, you, so let's say you're putting on a barbecue and you think of all the people you know, for your neighborhood, you think of all the people who are coming to your barbecue and you know that Ken is coming and he loves spicy stuff and Matt is coming and he is obsessed with, I don't know, tacos or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, and so you think of who's coming to your barbecue and what you do is you put out the things that make the most sense based on what you know about who's coming to your barbecue. But then when they get there, it's up to them to choose what they want at the barbecue. I wouldn't say, Hey Matt, dude, you love tacos. I got you tacos. You're going to eat those tacos. Um, I put him out knowing he likes them. And I know Ken loves spicy stuff. So a UDL classroom is really similar where you, it's different than different differentiation where you're saying like, you get the blue sheet and you get the red sheet and all this. It's basically saying you have to really, really know your kids and not just their levels, but their, their modalities of learning and put out very well thought options for them. So when they come into class, they can choose to watch the video. They can choose to read the book. They can choose to use a pencil, use a highlighter, um, 
they have some choices, but they're very thought out choices based on what you think is best for them. Um, so that's the idea. The whole idea of universal design for learning is what's good for one is what's good for all. So you might put out one thing for one kid, think it's for them, but it, uh, you know, another kid can easily take advantage of the same resource or opportunity. That was perfect. So, flipped you. learning. <laughs> All right. So flipped learning, I think, is very different than flipped classroom. And I think they always get confused. So I'll, I'll do that real quick. So if, if people hear flipped learning, they think flipped classroom. They think they'd be very, we'll say, stereotypical. Like, I record a lesson. Kids go home and watch it. Then they do the activity in class. Um, that's a flipped classroom. And so flipped learning is, it could be flipped classroom. But flipped learning is really the idea of that um, the students are getting the material kind of at their own pace. So for me, like I'll, I'll record all my lessons, but the kids watch the videos in class. So they said, I do an in-class flip, which to, if you're new to flip learning is a really interesting, weird concept. Cause you're like, why would a kid watch a video of you when you're there? And I can go on and on about all the benefits of that. But um, in a nutshell, flip learning is them accessing the content kind of on their own. And then you get to be more of a guide on the side who's helping them with their learning or just having nice conversations with kids along the way. So, but either way, you're not standing up lecturing anymore. So first of all, Matt is here, by the way, I am. <laughs> I'm not I am. Let, I'm, I'll, I'll jump I'm not in letting in him moment. talk because I am, uh, I, I am, uh, you're right. We're right in the same wheelhouse here, Kyle. These are two of my, my biggest passions by far, which Matt, Matt knows. So I'm really curious. And then Matt, I will let you ask questions. All right. All right. Did, UDL come first in your classroom and then flipped learning or was it flipped learning and then UDL or somewhere in the middle? Yeah. So it actually was flipped learning. And so I didn't even know what UDL was. I didn't even know I was doing it for a little while, but basically my wife's um, father is a, was a principal and it was like basically right when flipped learning was just starting. And he's like, yeah, I got some teachers doing this flipped learning thing. And just my personality, I was like, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. Let's just see how it is. And I did it and I did the very stereotypical, they watched it at home and there was a lot of parts that I didn't like because, you know, kids weren't doing it. It was hard and I wasn't there. So I was one day I had this epiphany or whatever it was. I was like, let me let them watch it in class. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much better. I'm there to help them. But then what happened was it was this one moment. I'll tell you that that transformed flip learning to UDL is I had all the kids watch videos and that they, every kid had to watch the video. And then one girl was like, I really don't like your videos. I can't learn from your videos. And I was like, all right, well, what can I provide for her? And so she just, I literally just gave her some textbook pages. So nothing fancy by any means. But then it, the lesson was, all right, students, you guys can watch the video about, you know, digestive system, or you can read these pages. And then it just had this snowball effect. And I was like, or you can watch this extra video, or this is a really cool resource. And so little by little, flip learning is really what started it. But it, it gave me the opportunity to, be, to really kind of create this UDL environment but flip learning the video is still kind of like the main course again i'm gonna stick with the food analogy that most people chose um so that was kind of where that went it ended up being a very addictive process so ken i don't know if you went through this but i <laughs> i went way too far i was like choices are amazing i was like you guys have 20 choices now for digestive system aren't i the best teacher ever and of course you know choice paralysis they were like i don't even know what to do so then of course i had to bring it back and really be like okay here are a few very good choices, again, based on different needs. And I wouldn't, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so that was kind of the journey. And then again, I can go on and on, but over the last seven years, it's been a lot of fine tuning of that model. Can you just speak to student choice in there as well? I'm assuming that in that component, which is a, a big, um, I don't know if buzz is the right way to put it, but I know that something current right now where in that UDL process and what have you, the kids having the choice to make a suggestion or um, kind of having some input. Can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, so, right, student choice, I mean, I'm gonna agree with you. Student choice is a buzz word right now, right? So, um, and so I think there's, if you're gonna go very UDL, there's kind of um, a couple ways choice, right? There's choice about getting the content, um, and there's choice about showing that you understand the content, right? And I will tell you an area I'm still working on is the showing you understand it. That's definitely an area I still need to improve upon. Um, so my choice I'm talking about is they have the opportunity to figure out how they want to get the content. It's very finish line first. It's like, hey, by the next week, this is all the stuff we need to know. Here are your different options for how you can get it. And so, like I said, I do videos, uh, but I, I'm also very big on not 
making sure I have like tactile things too. Like I said, like, so if I'm doing digestive system, I'll have a, hopefully if I can, like real life stomach or intestines out there, but then I'll have a whiteboard where kids can just collaborate and draw and stuff like that. So again, try to really think. So if I say choices, um, that's kind of what I mean, but, um, but it's really, really hard for kids at first to, to come up with a choice because they have, they just want, they, they want you just to tell them what's the best choice. Like that, like just tell me what's going to get me. me an a. It. Yeah. 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 And, and I don't blame them. That's how they've come up. But so um, we've had to do a lot of practice and failing. And like, for me, I had like on my wall, I had like each month of like the goal, like I was like today, like September's goal was to figure out the pace you learn best at. Like really simple. Like when you watch a YouTube video of my lesson, is it one time speed or 1.5 times? Like so, so I know it sounds like a silly thing, but like forcing them to almost experiment each little by little so they can figure out, hopefully by the end of the year, they're like, oh yeah, I love videos. I love to watch this speed. I actually do better if I sit on the ground. I don't do well if I work with my friends. Like giving them different opportunities to, to of what they should choose and experiment with um, throughout the year is kind of the way I like to do my teaching. So uh, in the kind of the same mindset, I, I realized how important that decision making was for my, my fifth graders to be successful in a, a similar environment. So as a homeroom teacher, I felt like I was at a huge advantage because I had most of the day with them. So I was able to really evaluate how I ran the entire day and how often and how often I had them make decisions. So, for example, you know, when I first started morning work, when they came in was a directed set of, of math boxes that I wanted to work on um, in our in our program that we had. Uh, move, fast forwarding to my last two years, I, it was total choice. And all they had to do was say to me if I walked up to them and said, hey, Kyle, you know, why are you reading right now? And you responded with, well, Mr. Ehrman, I don't owe you any work and I'm just kind of tired, so I just want to relax. My response would be, great, thanks. You You know why you made that decision and that's what I was really trying to move towards. As a secondary teacher, you have much less time with them, and it's it the you know it's usually the expectation of, of curriculum um, is is so important because of that time you have, especially in a tested area of science. So, what were some other ways that you were kind of granting yourself that time to force them to just be in the habit of making more decisions? So, I'm also I'm going to be honest with you. So. I've been really lucky that I have not had the pressure of curriculum and in our, our district and that seventh grade science is not a tested area. So I think your question is absolutely valid. And that's the, whenever I do workshops, that is always the biggest pushback I get. And usually it's a lot of math teachers who kind of have that pushback because they do have such a tight curriculum. So I just by nature, honestly, have had the time I haven't had to force it. And for me personally, it's just really important to me. Um, so without, I don't you know who's listening to this, but like I would sometimes cut some stuff out that I thought was less important because this to me was really important. Um, so I don't know. So I kind of just really tried to make time and, but okay. Okay. So I'm going to answer your question, right? But also if I'm going to give advice to who's ever listening here, things that are important to you have part as your routine. So for example, like for me, checking in with a kid, just how they're doing in life was really important to me, like a systematic check-in. But if I, I found that if I didn't have that, like as part of a regular routine, I would forget sometimes and, and things would fall. And so for me, after, after every quiz they took, so let's just say every week or two, right, a little small quiz, every kid had to do a reflection about the decisions they made in that previous week and the decisions they made that were good and that, that weren't good. And again, that's a whole different thing I can talk about that really enhances UDL. But at the very bottom of that was always a question like anything going on in your life you want to tell me. Um, so... I never had to try to remember to ask them. It was always just part of their after quiz reflection. Um, so I guess what I'd say is advice to people who want to squeeze things in is try to almost like if you can combine it with something else and something that's already a routine, um, that helped me a lot with just little things like that. To kind of talk about the time thing, because I think that's the biggest crunch. Obviously, you're doing a ton of work before, um, before the kids walk into the classroom because – a, you're a subject matter expert in what you're teaching. So whether that's just your own interest, studying, keeping up on the topic, um, studying standards, just recognizing all of those components, in addition to, uh, I guess, testing and preparing different choices that you would guide the learners to um, receive content and potentially kind of produce their learning. When 
considering what goes into a daily lesson, what does that framework look like? Because I, I, I'm a fourth grade teacher that teaches five subjects, five lessons at minimum in a day. You may repeat concepts over and over again. What goes into a single lesson? Because UDL flipped classroom feels intimidating to certain classrooms. And um, what what is that manageable point that the worth is worth the work? That is such a good question because that is, again, like the biggest thing is there is a lot of upfront time. Um, so I can just tell you my advice on the time-saving pieces of, of this model that I've done. Um, but you're right, like you have to teach five things a day and um, that's hard. And so here's, I guess, my, my UDL advice and then my flip learning advice for, for time. UDL, when people hear it and they hear choice, it feels like you just said very overwhelming of like, oh, cool, like you do that. I'm supposed to offer five choices and I do this day after day after day. And so it's so easy just to say like, I can't, right? Um, so whenever I, I talk about UDL, I always use this example of a highlighter. So let's just say that you are giving, um, your kids an assignment, right? Whatever it is. And you you put out a highlighter on each table or a couple highlighters and you say, Hey, there's a highlighter there in case you want to use it while you're doing your reading of your article or whatever it is. Like that's UDL it, at the simplest level. You just put out a highlighter that some kids might want, some kids might not want, and you can leave a bin in the table with, UD, with a, a bucket of highlighters on there. And so therefore, you did something once, and therefore, it's there and there's some student choices. So there are some things that you can do like that that don't have to be so time-consuming. So I would say just try to think of things that will offer choice. Even, like I said, flexible seating is such an easy example, too. You know what I mean? Like once you have certain seats out or whatever it is and system set up, you don't have to do it day in and day out. So for UDL, as far as choice, think of really small choices that are easy to do that you don't have to prep every day. And then for certain lessons, of course, you can modify. But I'd always start there because I, my what happened to me, what happens to a lot of people I've talked to is it gets, like I said, it gets addicting. You're like, that was awesome. What else can I do that is not a lot of work for me, but also offers, offers opportunity for kids. So that's, that's the UDL piece. As far as the flip learning, I am such a big advocate of easy as possible. Like if you, if you had seen me making my lessons, so I did have to record them before school. Um, but like, I still, have, unless my content's changing, I can use videos year after year until I really need to change it up. But I would literally just put my iPhone on top of a chair and I would be like up at my board. Like I was lecturing to an empty class. So people, thing. Yeah. So people walking by, so can you get it right? People walking by, think you're a crazy person, but, but at the end of the day, I did it with an iPhone. I didn't edit anything if i messed up i just the, the kids are kids and they understand that you mess up and i would just take that and on the iphone i hit like upload to youtube and that's it so there's no editing no whatever so i think the idea of making videos is also very scary and overwhelming but it's if you can just teach a lesson in 10 minutes then you have it's there so i'd always say to keep your video making as uh simple as possible otherwise i would never do it if i had to edit hundreds of videos or however many i have at this point I'm, I am so glad you said that. I probably about four or five years ago presented at an ed tech conference and it was on the topic of flipped learning. And I, I said the same thing. I talked about how <laughs> it was an iPad, not an iPhone, propped up on a chair with books. I didn't have a tripod. I didn't yeah, have microphones. Okay. Um, you know, just, just doing my best teaching, just teaching what I knew, the skills that I knew. And I had someone walk up to me after the session and, and, they thanked me specifically for that part because they had left a previous flipped learning session from someone who um, is very – they were nationally known as someone involved in flipped learning. And they talked about green screen and production and lighting and editing and all of these things about it needs to be professional. It needs to be high quality or the students aren't going to be engaged. They left that session feeling like they could never do flipped learning and they left mine feeling like they could. Because I completely disagree with that that approach. Because like you said, Kyle, it's it's not realistic. There's no way you would have time to do that. And you know, I had a you talked about making mis making mistakes or messing up. I was teaching a lesson on long division, 
And at the end process where you had to add up all of the partial quotients, I literally added the numbers wrong and got the answer wrong on, you know, one of the three demo problems that I did. No clue until a student told me the next day, you know, hey, Mr. Erman, did you know you got number three wrong? I said, yeah, of course. I wanted to see if you could catch that mistake. But, um, you know, I, I told the kids afterwards, like the next day when we were reflecting on the lesson, did anybody pick up on it? And we talked about that. And when I went back and watched the lesson, I realized that my objective was to teach long division through partial quotients. And if you watch that, they would learn how to do long division through partial quotients and they would see where you can make a mistake. So I use that, le I've never redone that lesson because it hit my objective. And that's always my advice to teachers is know what you wanna teach, watch it back. Will the students learn that skill or that objective? If the answer is yes, you're done and publish it. I don't care if your grade partner walks in and you know screams at you and you're yelling at them like, hey, get out of here, I'm filming a lesson. Like kids will laugh at that, they'll love that kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't have to be this high quality professional production because one, it's not necessary. And two, it's just totally unrealistic to be able to implement into your classroom. Uh, digging into flipped lessons, can you give us some advice on like key components that you think need to be in there in terms of like, what does the, the structure look like? Because in theory, you're taking perhaps a 45 minute class and dwindling it down to a smaller chunk of time like how long do you think it should be and what is what do you think that flow of the lesson should look like well i can i mean i can just tell you what my flow is and again i'm who knows what would work for everyone else but i will say um someone told me once about the timing that it, a video should be no longer than one minute per grade and that, that has always stuck with me. Um, so okay, if you're third grade teaching third grade, your video should be no longer than three minutes. And so, of course, you might have more than three minutes worth of content, but each individual video um, should be no longer than that. So if I have a longer topic, I'll break it up into shorter videos. But I try to stick with that, that most of my videos are six minutes long. But you said like the 45 minutes. I, rem <laughs> I remember when I first did this, it was almost embarrassing because I thought the same thing. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is normal lecture. It's like 45 minutes. All right. And then I recorded just the, the, the meat and potatoes of the lesson. And it was like eight minutes. And I was like, what am I doing? What, what, what happens in class for the other 40 minutes? Like, and, and of course you think about it and there's a lot of like conversations that are valid and, and rich, but there's also a whole lot of just like waiting for kids to write down. And it's like, wow. Um, Behavior management. Yeah. <laughs> getting materials yes. yeah yeah so so that was um eye-opening for me and can actually just i I'm, I'm already pivoting off your first question to behavior management can i address that because that comes up for a second that comes up a lot too with any kind of situation where your class now is like you're giving up control that's because that's what you're doing right like you're you're, you're standing back your guide on the side and people this kid's doing this and this kid's doing this and so the question i get is like isn't that like madness, right? Isn't, isn't that like crazy? And to me, my experience, and again, you guys can chime in too, is that it has helped a lot with classroom management because like, think of like when you're lecturing, the kid who's bored because you're going too slow acts up because she's going too slow. And the kid who is frustrated because you're going too fast is going to act up because you're going too fast and, and that. But now that every kid can go at their own pace, like and they don't have an audience because they're kind of in their own little bubble or with a small group. Like my classroom management, I don't know. It was like surprisingly so much better. I don't know if you guys had a similar experience or different with classroom management. hundred percent, hundred percent. Absolutely. And we're doing at the school district, we've talked about on the podcast before, uh, MCL, are you familiar with that? Mass customized learning? No. Okay. So it's just to, to kind of glorify it. It's the idea of students being, grouped based off of their ability level and what they're currently instructing on or, or need instruction on. So you could have a third grader in a class with a fifth grader um, for different con uh, instructional areas. It's helpful that it's we're in a small school district, but realistically you have, it's not uh, what heterogeneous, it's homogeneous based grouping um, and kids can progress at their own rate, which kind of goes right alongside with what you're doing and progress through with prove it's but it's a terrible explanation in short um but one of the the things that's striking me of what you're saying is yeah when when you move away from this i had a, a high school teacher 
that was struggling with what to do with their time because they went full fledged into flipped classroom and felt like without the distractions that they ended up having, I don't know, five to eight minutes worth of videos, a really powerful 12 minute conversation, some time for the kids to complete their pro problems. And on certain days they were done. Um, which was a challenge that I never met, <laughs> never met with, but um, something that is a real thing to consider. What do you do in that scenario as you create time? And, and that may be relationship development. It may be extension. It may be asking for higher product um, and results, something they can actually be, be proud of, uh, what have you. One of the things related to that that I'm, I just, I'd love to get your feedback in is as you're building these lessons, they don't need to be grand, wonderful. You're talking about time frame. I, I, I frequently heard that it's better to have many short videos than one long video to, that they get through. I have had conversations with colleagues that their idea of throwing a video into an Edpuzzle type environment breaks up a long video enough to kind of create that safeguard and check in do you feel like there's a way especially as we're coming out of uh, digital teaching there are ways to um, extend the lessons longer or do you stick to that time frame I'll give you my input three to five minutes at least for my age kids is the max amount of content that the kids can understand that I would much rather than practice those skills but I've been getting pushback of I have all this content to cover. If I can check and make sure they're with me through multiple choice questions, which are just the most high level thinking style that you could possibly receive, what, what's your kind of feeling on that since there are ways to really check to see if they understood it, um, but also tap into using that full time frame? So I'll address a couple of those questions. So first off, Edpuzzle is awesome. Um, and as a tech coach, my last three years, it's been a lifesaver for a lot of people. Um, I personally, it goes against my philosophy and I can explain that in a little bit, um, because it still has the gotcha mentality of the, um, more of a mandatory piece versus a resource for them. Um, but I do think I'd puzzle if you use correctly with the breaking up could be decent in the sense of like you watch a video, if it breaks up and then it gives them some sort of other task that has them maybe step away from the computer and then they can revisit and go back, then I do think that a longer video could be chunked. But I think the idea, it sounds like the, the example you said is almost like the teacher is just like keeping a tight eye to make sure the kid is, is getting it. Um, and it, it's, it's still probably better than just giving them a 15 minute video for sure. Um, but I still would be in favor of the short uh, video. But um, like I said, I, I still think that meant it's, it's, it's such a mentality thing, right? It doesn't matter the tool you use. Like you want to give three to five minutes because you're thinking of your kids. It sounds like, and you're like, their brains are going to lose it. Sure. I could force 10 more minutes out of them and they might get it. But then like, you sacrifice their mental health and the relationship you have with the, I don't know. I just feel like it's such a bigger, a bigger question than just simply like how long a video should be. Honestly, is what it sounds like. Can I add one more follow up real quick? Do you, what is your feeling about, uh, cause I know Ken ha could go on forever on, on some of these concepts. What is your feeling about the kids, um, kind of in that, like, Hey, I feel accountable. I feel like I actually, was focused because you have to teach kids to watch videos instructionally. It is not something that you even drop a five minute video and expect them to understand that, that is a lot of what, if you're going to use flip learning or any of these features that you model and you um, safeguard up until the point of what a standard lesson will look like. That component being said, would you, what's your view on, outsourcing your information compared to you teaching and recording the information. Are you passionate about it being, because I know at least in the last um, 18 months, kids hearing my voice or seeing my face talking about a content seems tedious, but so much more personal than 
going to Edtopia or to Discovery Ed, pulling a resource and plopping in front of kids. Yeah. So basically it sounds like your question is like, do you need to make your own videos if you're going to do flip learning or can you just use YouTube videos and stuff like that? So this is a, a big point I always talk about too. I personally believe you should make your own videos. Um, like you just said the personal piece, but you are the only one who knows your class, your grade, your topic, and the best way to deliver it. You're never going to find that YouTube video out there that can deliver your content to your kids as well as you can. Plus also the accountability. I, like it, it also shows the parents that you know what you're talking about too, and it shows the kids you know what you're talking about. However, I personally also like to have, there are plenty of really good videos that people have made that are amazing that I don't want to deprive them from either. So I, again, my menu, my buffet is always, my, I have a lesson that is me describing it and most kids will go there and I always pick one or two really good YouTube videos that also I think uh, as a supplement and some kids who need to see that as an extra will review it some kids watch my video and they're good um but i i do very much believe you need to make your own videos um without going to a whole long story again i had a parent when i didn't do it, when i first started i just gave some youtube videos i remember i was teaching physics and i was like here's a video and i had a parent who said to me i just had my first kid she said to me i'll never forget it i know you think you don't need to teach now because you have a kid but I don't even remember the rest of it because I just like blanked out. I just, so, and at first, of course, I'm like, what do you mean? But either way, it could very much look like your teacher who's saying, go watch this video and learn from that person. And so she wasn't wrong. It does give that impression sometimes. So I think there's a whole lot of reasons that you need to make your own video. I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. And like you said, in, in your buffet, the fact that you're giving choice, you know, you mentioned earlier about the students saying like, I'm struggling to learn from you. So you know, you don't need to go and publish an article on the digestive system in a science journal. Like you can find that resource. So it's kind of the same idea with the videos. And I'll also just add into that. Again, I 100% agree we should be making our own. But if you're if you're making your own and you're finding success in the system and and uh, that it's working for your students and you're starting to feel like you can't keep up, especially as an elementary teacher, if you're teaching multiple subjects then feel free to substitute them in. Substitute in the ones that you're gonna struggle with more. And then next year, you don't have to make any of the videos that you've already made, or you don't have to make most of the videos you already made. And you can substitute a little bit more of yours in. So over the course of a few years, you'll have a larger library of, of resources that you don't need to outsource as much. But you know, from a parent's perspective, if they see that you are making a lot and you're substituting once in a while, you're not going to get that you're not going to get that pushback because they can see that you're you're using it to design a system that's a better learning environment for their students um so this is i i didn't know we were going to talk about this you know matt and i've said before like our shows are unscripted kyle and i were talking about it when we met 10 minutes ago um i saw that he had some flipped lessons on his youtube channel and that was about it but um <laughs> I mean, this is this topic is just so important for for students. It's it's great for teachers. And, you know, I would just circle back to what Kyle has said is 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 design it in a way that you think is going to benefit the students as much as it can, because it it you have to be comfortable with it and you have to, you know, kind of want to take that approach with students. You want to have to design a different classroom if you're using these videos, but you're not doing you're not finding time to do more, for lack of a better term, cool stuff in your room. The kids aren't going to be as motivated to do that. And Matt, you mentioned about, you know, you got to train the kids and you have to show them how to interact with those lessons. And and the last thing that I just want to hit on, Kyle, you said about that, meant that gotcha mentality. I found that, you know, when I first started, it was flip classroom. It was watch at home, then come in. And, and very quickly, I kind of transformed the same way that you did. Uh, once I had more available and, and I just saw that it could be a better experience with them watching in class and having choice in what they watched. But I reinforced to the students, like, listen, this is, I'm creating these and giving these to you because it's a way for you to learn the information. If you're choosing to just goof off in class or you're choosing not to do something that I ask you to do during the evening, you're just choosing not to learn. And it, what I didn't punish them. I didn't keep them in from recess. I just reminded them like you're preventing yourself from learning and so it transforms that gotcha mentality to a let's all just focus on learning and growing 
and and utilizing the skills that this class can offer us and i and students become more motivated to just genuinely learn in your class so i i really appreciate that you said the the mentality piece so that was question number one mr nemus <laughs> in year five to seven uh 30 minutes later so you you transitioned into being an ed tech coach so you know maybe speak to why you made that decision and just you know how you've found the ability to continue to support teachers and students um, in the way that they learn and experience school. Um, so the why is um, I, I'm not even like a lover of tech, which is crazy because how much I use it, and like I, we'll hopefully talk about the couple tools that I've even made. Um, I just love variety and change and challenges and. Um, after 12 years in the classroom, it, I was just excited to try a new adventure. And, but it's really hard. I, I will say like, cause I, I feel like even th this podcast, I think we're giving good advice, but like it's, oh, it's always hard not to go on like a soapbox. You know what I mean? Like the last thing I ever want to do is tell anyone how to do their job when everyone is doing the best they can. So that was always a, that was something I really wanted to do is, is help teachers, but also in a way that wasn't me telling them like the best way to do it, but really just listen to them and hear what they need and um, I don't know, do some cool stuff. That was really what I wanted to do with my job is help them do the cool things they always wanted to bring to life. So that was fun. And that was always my mentality is how can I make their lives easier or cooler? That was, that was my job um, without telling them how to do their job. So yeah, it's been fun. But like I said, I'm going back to the classroom next year. And I feel like, especially now after this podcast, it's getting me more ramped up and excited to go back into doing some of the stuff I love with the kids. So, cause I definitely, I, I coach some sports and stuff like that. So I got to hang out with some cool kids, but I don't know. This is a, uh, that was definitely a piece I was, I was missing. So I'm kind of pumped to get back with some kids. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the same role as you now as a coach. And usually after these podcasts, I like, I, I love my role, but I'm always like, man, I wish I could get back in and, and do that one thing or use that one strategy that they're sharing. So do you have any advice? I'm going to be very selfish right now. Do you have any advice for me? Because I have felt exactly the same where there's a fine line between listening and supporting a teacher and being on that soapbox. And I don't want to be on that soapbox, but I do want to serve up ideas and, and kind of dive into those conversations about what, what they could do with their classroom. Have you found any, you know, uh, secret sauce to that approach or just, you know, what have, what have you learned over the past couple of years with that? So I guess what I've learned is there's a lot of people you probably would love to share advice with that you aren't going to, and that's fine. But I found the people who are most interested in my point of view are the people who I was first interested in their strengths and their points of view. So for me, a lot of times the best conversations I had would when I would ask them, like, what is, I heard you're doing this. I feel like I would do a lot of like, I heard you're using this tool. Can I just like, can I see it and learn from you? And so oftentimes, like, and it was authentic. It wasn't like a bait and switch kind of thing. It was authentic. But when I would go and I'd actually go into their classroom with the whole purpose of just trying to learn this tool they're using, they would be so excited to tell me the tool that we, you know, a lot of those would then be like, but what tool would you use for A, B, and C? Or like, would you then, then they would ask my question and my advice. And then if they did, and I would be happy to share whatever I could with them. But I found the best conversations and teaching happened when I was willing to learn as much as I could from them first. And it, I think it put down some of the guard and they were excited to listen to ideas. I think, I think it's hard. One of the things in your position is I'm sitting here as a classroom teacher, you're sitting there as the advisor, your role puts you as a kind of a, my priority is, incorporating technology into instruction and sometimes it doesn't necessarily feel like you have complete focus of the stressors and i'm not talking about you kyle specifically but one of that challenges is as you get away from the classroom remembering all of the requirements all the stressors that really go into that classroom environment so how do you uh, obviously you'll have a great taste of this in a few months when you're back in the classroom how do you really keep fresh with what are those stressors? Because you have totally different stressors. It is a challenging position by all means to support teachers, but I'm, I'm sure that the connection, as you were saying, you investing in your colleagues and them investing in you is a huge benefit. What's one element that you uh, try to do to, to kind of 
remind yourself of the environment because we all get caught up in our own kind of challenges. Yeah, I can't lie. That was my biggest fear is like hypothetically, if I stay in this position for another, I don't know, three, four years, would I lose touch? Because we hear of so many people who have lost touch, administrators, things like that. So um, I don't have the answer for you. I can tell you that was just a fear of mine as well. I was terrified that I, at some point I was going to lose what it was like to be a teacher. And then how could I help someone? I don't even remember what it's like to be like. Um, so I try just to listen and be in it and always empathize and always go on the side of pushing less, not trying to push my own agenda. But um, but I, I think you're right. I think unless you're in it, 100%, especially this year, like this year, I would say like, you're right, this year was busy for me in a different way. But like, I almost felt that, I guess it's like you know, survivor's guilt, you know, that you have. Like, I honestly felt that in my position. Like, I'm seeing the people I care about who are just struggling hard and I'm trying to help them, but they are, their jobs are so much harder than mine is right now because of what they have to do. So um, I just, I don't know, I just felt awful and did everything I could to be there and listen and support, but, um, but I don't, I don't have the answer to that. And I wish I did. It is, it is a challenge. And, and like you said, administrators, for the most part, even the great administrators, they lose, they lose touch of that. It's just, it's just part of the role, but it's almost like they're, they're not supposed to, but it's just expected that that happens. Whereas as the coach, it's not supposed to happen. We're, we're in that middle, that middle span. So it's, it's important that we don't, but it is, it is a challenge uh, to, to not do so. Even simple things like when I'm trying to help teachers and it's a, a rostering issue with our LMS to our, to our student information system. I can't practice that because I don't have a roster. So like a lot of times it's, I have to waste their time troubleshooting with them. Whereas if it's just a tool or it's a strategy or something that I can practice on my own or even just make for them on my own, I feel better in those situations where it's sometimes like I don't have great answers for them, but I think that humility is also important for them to see. So you mentioned your products. So uh, I know I've, I've looked at them a little bit, but please uh, tell our audience about them, how it can benefit them and kind of your, your passion as to why you've, you've created them. Yeah. So I am the co-founder of Classroom Q, which maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. We are still small-ish, um, but it's nice because we just talked all about how my classroom looks. So this is a really easy kind of segue. So basically in my classroom, I was the guide on the side and kids were usually on devices. So I'd kind of always be walking around helping kids nonstop, talking to kids. Um, and it drove me crazy when I would see a kid just standing there with a hand in the air, or like two kids with a hand in the air. And yeah, you, know, you play the normal teacher game. Like, yeah, one second, I'll be right with you. And you get with this kid and they're still sitting there. And so I went to a workshop in the summer and it was, um, someone was presenting a tool that was like a digital hand raising tool like a, of a cue. And I was like, yes, thank you. Like, that's exactly what I need for my classroom. So I can just like chip away at this list and kids can tell me they need help without having to like run, you know, waste time with their hand up. But then turns out the tool wasn't that. It was something totally different. And so I started Googling and I was like, all right, where is this tool? And it didn't exist. And I was like, wait a minute, how is there not a tool in the classroom where kids can just say, click a button, tell the teacher they need help. And it's like, so um, really long story short, I partnered up with another teacher and we had no idea how to code or anything like that. And we gave it a go. And after about a year of a lot of <laughs> trial and error, uh, we made it and we've been now out for the last three years. And so that's what our tool does. It's beyond simple, but it's just like kids click a button and they see where they are in line. Hey, you're, you're third in line. Um, and the teacher, it's such a stress reliever. I know I'm biased, but like I, even in my classroom, like when we were testing it, the site would go down. I'd like, oh, no, the kids to sit their hand up now. Um, it was just really a nice tool. So I could just like the kid knows that they their, your, their request has been heard. It's really great for small group instruction. Like if you're walking with a, working with a small group of kids, they can just hit the button and then you they know that you're going to get to them as soon as you can and they can keep on working on whatever they want. So that's all we do. It's 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 super simple. Classroom and the letter Q dot com. And um, yeah, I mean, and we made it and it's been cool and it's been specifically made for a blended kind of uh, atmosphere. That's that's really cool. I uh, I looked into it and and now hearing you explain that more, if I were teaching fifth grade still, I would be using that because, like you said, same thing. Student raise their hand, they're waiting for you, or you're yelling across the room like, "Keep working!" Like I'll be there in a second when you're with that small group. So that's that's a neat product. 
Yeah, I, I just want to add to that. I think that even in in the elementary environment, I think that that idea of the the anxiety for the kids side of things too is one of those things that if they can shelf it, because we've all had those kids that will wait until you finally come to sit next to them. Um, that's especially a, a tool that matches really the teaching that we should be providing kids. I think that that's awesome. Um, can you kind of, uh, is it kind of cross platform? Is it one of those things that um, the, the students, can you kind of speak a little bit as we use a variety of different devices, uh, kind of the functioning behind it? Yeah, so it's, it's all browser based. So kids will just go to classroomq.com on their iPad, Chromebook, or our kids use the Chromebook, so whatever they're on. Um, so it doesn't matter. And then same thing with the teacher. You could log on with your computer. I personally logged on with my computer. Then I also logged on with my phone. So I would walk around and be able to just to kind of chip away at the list instead of having to go back to my computer and stuff like that. So, um, yep, no, no app or anything like that. It's just, just on the, the browser and it's, uh, it's good. And going back to your piece of what you said, it does, at least it seems in my classroom and for other people, it's some of those quiet kids who are terrified to raise their hand. It gives them uh, an outlet to do that. Um, but also, again, I'm just going to obviously talk about my tool and the things I think it, it has unexpected, unexpected positive things is if you, like, if you have a classroom environment where you're cool projecting a list so everyone can see, it's really cool because like, all right, so like imagine Matt, you're, raised, you're sitting there with your hand up and I'm in class with you. I have no idea what your question is. So therefore, as your peer, I, I don't know, I'm not going to help you. But with Classroom Q, the kid has the opportunity to type in their question. So like if you're a peer and you see, you know, Matt has the question that was the same thing that you had a question about a little bit ago, you can just, you can help them out. So it actually, it, it helps a lot of people with peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So that was pretty cool too. Um, That's but, really cool because, it, and it, what I love about it is, you know, I, I constantly remind teachers, if you can find ways to use technology, you know, in my mind, there's two, there's two ways. It creates a more like innovative, creative experience for kids and teachers, and it helps us be more efficient. And both of those are equally important. And, you know, like automatic grading stuff, like that's an efficiency tool that allows you to then guide your instruction the next day or, or during that class. I was big on having students help each other, but it required me to talk to Matt to find out what Matt's question was. And then I could say, go talk to Kyle. Kyle is the expert on blank. So I was encouraging that behavior, but it was still always had to route through me. Whereas what you're saying with your, with that cue and having their list of reasons, the students can take over that themselves. And, and Matt knows better than anybody. If I can find a way to have the students take over more of the decision-making and the actions in the class, I'm, I'm all for that. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it depends on your classroom environment, right? If you feel comfortable enough to do that, but it's, it's definitely helps some people. So yeah, it's, it's been cool. And so what's the, what's the second one that you, that you're um, rolling out now? Well, or do you actually, someone? do you want me to, do you want me to, yeah, actually, I'd love to talk about that, but I feel like I have to answer the question too, because the question from every teacher is always, is it free, right? That's, that's always the question. So let me at least answer that because I'm sure everyone's like, okay, cool. But what's the price point or whatever it is, right? Um, I will say that 99% of our users use the free version. Um, basically, it's free. The, 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 we do have a paid version, the pro version. Um, and I'm going to be honest, like, the, we, that, that helps pay for the site. You know what I mean? Like, we, we are, I promise you, we're not, <laughs> we are like breaking even. We're making enough money right now to keep on doing this site. So, um, and so the free version allows you to have up to five kids in the queue at any given time. So it just means that as long as five kids don't need you at that exact moment, which most teachers don't have five hands in the air at the same time, then the free version's fine. Um, but then the pro version lets you have more than five kids on there and you can download the data afterward, the session as well. Um, but And that's 20 bucks for the whole year if you decide to go for it. So it's either free or 20 bucks for the year, but it's, like it's important to know that we are not trying to rob you by any means. Um, okay, so can I talk about our new one? You guys are the first official like podcast that I'm on talking about this new adventure. Um, yeah, so here we go. If you're still with us after, what, 45 minutes? Here we go. Um, <laughs> and you said you were so, tired. Uh, I know. You got me all ramped up and excited. See, you, you, you pulled it out of me. Um, so we, myself and two other ed tech coaches, had this idea for a while of there's got to be some way to like – two goals. One, bundle together some of your favorite ed tech tools to hopefully save you a little bit of money. Cause right now it's like, 
hundreds of tools. It's every man for themselves. You pay for this, you pay for that. So we really wanted to create a place where you can kind of bundle together different things. Um, but also because there's like hundreds of tools, we as three ed tech coaches are filtering out and only putting tools that we think are decent, legit, very good tools on our site. Uh, so hopefully you can go there and, and find some good stuff. So it's basically in a nutshell, it's called myedtechbundle.com and we haven't launched yet. So um, I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but we plan on launching um, the site in the summer, July or August. Um, and it's, it's basically our whole um, idea is we talk to all these companies. So like we have Pear Deck on, we have Book Creator on, and, and but a bunch of other small names who are just excited to get out there. And so basically what we did is we said, in order to get on our site, you have to offer teachers a longer trial than you'd offer normally on your site. So I think Book Creator maybe has seven days, but they're offering three months on our site. Uh, so that's kind of our, what we're hopefully promising teachers, you can go to our site and every single one you can get, like a three month trial, two month, four month is in addition to whatever they already offer. Um, so it's a whole bunch of extra time you can get with the premium version of those tools. And the price point is again, super cheap. Like you can try, at least right now, uh, you can try uh, 10 different tools. If that's what you want for eight bucks. So like 80 cents a tool, like really the idea is like pick the things you think you've heard of, things you've never heard of that sound cool. And then again, for 80 cents a tool, whatever it is, you can hopefully get a whole lot of uh, access to the premium version. So that's, that's what we're launching. And we're, we're pretty pumped about hopefully helping some teachers out, helping some cool tools out um, and <laughs> seeing how it goes. Can I, can I just say something about the paid for items? I mean, I know some teachers feel like they have to do everything free. These are, both of these tools could be classroom changing. If you're a newer teacher really trying to incorporate ed tech tools to have a vetted source of really good places to start, this bundle is a phenomenal place to really identify. I, I, I'll speak from an example. I bought with a grant a random assortment of STEM equipment that I use two out of 10 items that I actually purchased. And so from that element, if I knew how I use that and what really connected to me, I would have invested way more into that. So the idea of a really high quality list that is already identified with trials, with support, I'm sure like, Experts really are the ones that are, are supporting that. That is a huge jumping off point for legitimately anyone that is using technology, which is all teachers. And I, I just, I think a lot of times if I were to talk to my wife, she would balk at the idea of spending like that freemium, what can I get for free? It will change your classroom. It is going to be at least efficient and worth the time. Uh, $20 for a year if it manages how you respond to students. It, it just, I, I love that idea. People will spend $5 on a cup of coffee, but won't spend $2 on an <laughs> app if it makes a huge difference. Like that, it is an outrageous concept that I, I hope that people really jump at those opportunities because it's a, like I said, it's one of those things, whether you're a new teacher, whether you've been doing it for a while, if you're a expert teacher really incorporating technology decently, this is a great way to feel like, A, you're, you're covering your bases of a bunch of different tech tools that you should probably consider. There's probably some you've heard before, but you haven't tried. Um, really, I, I think it's well worth your time and, and energy to, to dive into that. Well, and to that as well, Matt, um, the, the paid ones, like you said, I, I was going to give the same amount analogy with the cup of coffee, but you know, I, I constantly tell teachers, you should be steering towards the ones that have subscriptions and, and possibly the freemium ones where there's a free portion. And then there's an extension to that because if they are charging, there's a better chance they're going to be around. Doesn't it's not guaranteed, but there's a better chance that they're going to be there a year from now. But also with that and, and with this ed tech bundle can and we're not we're it's not like Kyle is sponsoring this podcast. We're just <laughs> we're finding out about these, you know, as as we're here. But there are products that for some teachers they need the premium and for others they don't. And so like Pear Deck and Nearpod are two great programs I really, I really think they're quality products for teachers, but for me and the way that I use them in my classroom, I didn't need the premium version of either of them because I got 
the best out of the free version of Pear Deck. I got the best out of the free version of Nearpod. And it wasn't something that I used on a daily basis. It was maybe 10 to 15 lessons for the entire year. Whereas there might be another tool where I'm using on a consistent basis in my classroom. And that's the one that I want to invest in. So I love that teachers will be able to really experience those premium versions longer through you to decide if it's something that they should invest in or not, because there will be some that they should and some that they, they can just be successful off the free version, like your classroom queue, that free version might be totally enough for them. I think the one other thing that I'll add is I know I did this for our district is I just kind of congregated everything that we had access to. Uh, just through a symbolu page of taking, hey, the district pays for this, our local IU, uh, our, our uh, instructional unit um, kind of purchases all these things. This is what you have access to that makes teachers not have to search beyond those doors to get started from. And it's a nice reminder of things that you could bring in if you're trying to pump up uh, a creative project or interactivity in the classroom it's a huge diving board into hey i know that i need to add something let me go here to really pull one of those features that again has been used in the classroom many times that's the reason why you guys pulled it it's it's highly suggested yeah or a good place to hopefully find something new right because this we, we have a handful of tools like this tool spindle which i just learned about myself but they're, they're brand new came out last two months ago but they just seem really cool they're designed for problem-based learning as two teachers who made it it just seems like a really cool thing that again like they're like how in the world are we going to get our name out there amongst everyone else so i don't know we're, we're also excited to really help some new people out who just have a cool idea who probably um, would have a much harder time getting their word out that's great so i want to i want to transition i'm looking at the clock and, and we're, we're getting up there in time so i want to i want to move into the lesson lens I'm really excited about this one uh, to, to dive deep into something you've done in your classroom. So Matt and I will ask you questions back and forth. Uh, feel free to take it any way that you want as, as we go through the conversation. So question number one, is it a unit overview, a long-term project, or a single lesson that you're going to share with us? I don't know. I feel like I just kind of shared my entire teaching style <laughs> with all of you right now and all my passions. Um I don't. I I was honestly going to talk to you about a general choice kind of lesson in my class with like UDL and all that stuff, but I mean we kind of dug deep into that. What would you like? Uh, what if we do just um, let's let's take it this way. Try to take the approach of what one single class looks like in one of your UDL in one of your units, like maybe like right in the middle of of a unit. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, and actually, then I can actually hit up a couple pieces of the lesson that I wanted to talk about. Perfect. Perfect. Let's do it. Beautiful. Um, would you kind of, I, I guess the, the main thing is, is there a time of year that you would teach this in or any kind of parameters that you would have as prerequisites that the kids would need to know in order to be successful? For this lesson, you're saying? Yeah. No, I mean, it, it just gets better and better as the year goes on because okay. they do better with it. Perfect. That makes sense. So what would be the objectives of this lesson? And obviously that might be varying depending on where they are. Okay. So let's just pick, honestly, it could be any lesson. We could say, I don't know, I've done digestive system. Let's say DNA, right? So the objective for a seventh grade kid is that they will know the basics of how DNA works, what it looks like, the components, just again, give them the foundational stuff for, for biology. Um, and then, so I, what I'd love to do is take you through just a couple of, I, I call it my, my four step process of, of what the kid would have to do. So step one, what the kid has to do in, whether it be day one of learning DNA, day two, day three, is every single day, they take a very short formative assessment about DNA. Um, and on day one, they bomb it and it's, and, you know, that, and that's on purpose. And then, so my whole goal of, of that is to get them very used to, um, th this is a, the whole point of this is not a great, it's to let you know how much you know about DNA. It's like, oh, cool. You know, 30%. That's not bad for day one. You know what I mean? So, so step one they do is take some sort of formative assessment. 
Step two they do, and again, this gets better as the year goes on because in the beginning it needs a lot of training. So let's just say we're in February and we're rolling here, right? They take their assessment, they get their 60%. Then the step two they do before they do their lesson is there's a Google form I give them, which basically says, how much do you know and what's your plan for the day? And so it'll give them a, like, hey, I got a 60 and I have a, ch it's a checkbox of all the main choices they could have that they would do in my classroom. And of course there's an other, but it's like, what are the two to three things you plan on doing over the next 40 minutes? So I know, and you know what you're going to do. Cause I used to not do that. And it was like, oh, go, you have freedom. And they'd be like, I don't know where to begin. So this really helped them plan out. I'm going to watch a flip lesson. I'm going to hold some organs and I'm going to have my quiz, my friend quiz me. Um, so they make a plan and then they would then go and do their choice learning, choose whatever they want to do, and I'm there to help them. And then let's just fast forward. I, again, I'm saying, this, I guess it's more of a unit. And then fast forward to a week later, they take their quiz on DNA, they crush it because they learned how they wanted to learn and they know everything they was to learn about it. And then I briefly talked about it before, they fill out their reflection piece. And it's just, a, it's besides that question about how's life, it's two questions. It's check, again, checkbox, all the good decisions you made that you made that contributed to your grade over the last week. Um, and then what of those check boxes are you still working on? And I will tell you, this was, a, again, this was something I'm really proud of. So I don't know if you do this, but I would recommend it. I used to just have the open-ended, what are decisions you made that were good, right? I think we've all done stuff like that. But for a lot of kids, they're like, I studied hard and I worked hard and I stayed focused. But what I did is I made a whole list of like 10 things that they didn't realize were maybe good habits. Like I showed up to class on time. I asked questions whenever I needed help. I, I, you know, I stayed focused. I um, didn't talk to my friends as much as I really wanted to talk to my friends. Like, so for those kids who made those decisions, like, oh yeah, I guess I did do A, B, and C, and like to really reinforce the good habits that they didn't even realize were good habits. So I found that to be, or, or the kid who didn't do it, would be like, oh, um, you know what I mean. But I found it to be really good for them to give a list of positive habits that they did versus what you know, an open-ended question. Um, so that is my one, my four step process that I've done in my class to really create learners that own their own learning. Um, and it's again, taken me a lot of tweaking over the years, but that that's my unit, a general unit in my class. That sounds awesome. Amazing. Yeah. So you kind of talked obviously about the student side of things. What is, and again, we've also mentioned that there's a lot going ahead beforehand. What are you doing during a lesson? Maybe in those four stages, what is your kind of role to make sure students are being successful? So when they're taking the quiz or their formative assessment, um, I, you, I'm at my computer looking at them take that three minute quiz. So I know exactly who I might want to target um, based on, hey, it's day three and they're only at 30%, that kind of thing. So step one is I'm looking at the data so I know exactly who I plan on talking to that day. When they fill out their plan for the day, there is an option that says, help me come up with a plan. So if they choose that option, then I, and that's more in the beginning of the year when they really say like, I don't know what I want to do. Can you come see me? So then I'll see that. And those are the people I always talk to first. I help them come up with their plan. Then I'm hitting up the people who struggled. And then during the choice learning time, that's kind of, that's the most fun time because when it's rocking and rolling, then like I am just watching kids be awesome, helping some kids who maybe need it. But really then I always say like this style, again, again, I don't know you guys experience this, the relationships you have with these kids like are so much better because like you can actually just have random small talk in the middle of your class with that kid who's about their soccer game and stuff like that. So like you're just, I don't know, because you couldn't do that in the middle of a lecture. So, so what I will say is I'm, talking to kids, helping, but also just getting to know kids and, and stuff like that. So that's, that's the gist of how a class like that would go. Um, but I think it's really important to say, and I know I'm going on a lot here, that that's not every day in my class. Like, and that's why I always tell the parents, they are not doing this every day. We're doing plenty of games and labs and kinesthetic activities and, and all sorts of other stuff besides computer-based choice learning. This is in a five-day week. This might be two, three days max, and the other days are, are other completely low-tech activities. I'm so glad you said that because I think that is not often talked about, and it's it's really it, – it was in my classroom. It kind of seems like it was for you. It's your main avenue for delivering content. Del content delivery is not an everyday occurrence regardless of your style 
It's just your style for that content de delivery component. And it's just an instructional strategy that you use. It's no lecturing is an instructional strategy. This is the same component to deliver sure. that content. So I, I'm really glad you said that. And I 100% agree about the relationship piece. I've had teachers, you know, sometimes not in a negative way, but challenge like, you know, well, if I'm always recording myself and they're always just watching TV like, or watching the, the lessons, like, you know, what's the point of me being there? And, and I say like, well, the reason I did it is because I wanted, I wanted more time with my kids, more time in a one-on-one -on -one or a small group basis. And those, those recorded lessons can offer that to you. So this, we always ask this question, but I feel like it's more fitting now uh, for you because you're moving back into the classroom. So when you go back into this and you're now facilitating this environment again, what advice do you have for yourself the next time you, you teach this and you, and you, and you restart this environment again? My advice to myself is to keep on trying to get better at the things that I am not good at. And I have a whole laundry list of things I'm not good at. So I'm going to each year, each lesson, chip away at some of those things that I need to improve upon. So that's, that's my advice to myself is keep on chipping away. Excellent. That's, that's great advice because that's just the way you have to approach teaching and learning. So our, our final four questions, we ask all of our guests every week uh, in our exit ticket. Question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? I mean, my gut says to care about them more than you care about grades and stuff like that. But um, I don't know. That's just what my gut says is actually care about them. Which hopefully you're doing, right? So yeah, that's probably really bad advice. If you're a teacher, you probably care about your kids, but I don't know. I think that, not take it too seriously. Yeah, there's an element of it's okay to care about the kids too. Yeah. Um, what's the best advice that you've gotten that you think of frequently? And it could be from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student. Um, so I don't know if it's the best advice, but again, first thing that comes to my head is, do you ever read that Jennifer Gonzalez article about the walnuts um, and the, no. oh, the marigolds and the walnuts? You ever read that article? Do you, know, you, guys, you guys know Jennifer Gonzalez? Hopefully. No. What? Jennifer Gonzalez, cult of pedagogy, 160,000 uh, yeah, followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She pedagogy, is the know, bomb. Yeah. She is so good. Yeah, it's cult of pedagogy. Jennifer Gonzalez. She's awesome. She writes this article for first year teachers, uh, Find Your Marigold. And it's, it's kind of messed up, but it's, it's great advice. And it's basically, she does a great job of just saying that like, when you are in, in there's going to be lots of people who are going to be awesome and going to help you grow. And there's going to be lots of people who are going to try to tear you down and they say you and tell you don't try so hard. And um, so she just basically says like, right from the start to cut out the people who suck out the energy um which is again i know a messed up message is my my best advice but it is like find those few people who totally make you like like if you guys were in the same school as me i feel like we would get ramped up together and come up with some cool stuff like you guys would be my marigolds and i would make sure i just spend as little time as i could with the people who are sucking the energy out of me i'm gonna say again you're saying that that's not the greatest advice but i think it's great advice because teachers they need to hear that and and that's part of the goal of this show, too, is to help teachers realize that you don't have to just look in your district. You can look beyond that, beyond your classroom, beyond your building, beyond your district and, and find those marigolds in other districts in other parts of the country. Because it's it's like you said, it's how you it's how you feel that way. And I, I, I totally agree. So the school year goes in waves. You hit the stressful moments of conferences, report cards, state testing. So in those in those lulls where teachers are really struggling, what would you like to say to them to really power up? Oh, I don't know. How, how do you power up through those hard times? I mean, like I said, I think it would be advice number two is find your people. But also, I, I would just really hope that you have something beyond teaching to put it in perspective, like family and said, I got three little kids and they are my happy place and my wife, too. So. I don't know. They're, they're usually my recharge. So I guess I would just hope that people, when the job gets too hard, is that you have something else in your life that, um, I don't know, helps you remember, but that's also incredibly important and recharges you. But yeah. The last question we have, and I know that we've talked about it a little bit, is how can our audience uh, keep in contact with you in the future, as well as the products that uh, everyone should go out and support? Um, so Twitter is the best. So it's just my name, Kyle Nemus, N-I-E-M-I-S, all one word. 
I do my best to keep up with the ed tech and tweet things I think are cool. And then I also have my messaging feature on. So whether we follow each other or not, you can message me and I, I get random messages all the time from people. And um, usually I usually, usually like to show up on a podcast. <laughs> like on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and usually I really enjoy talking to people so you can you can message me and hopefully I can, i'll get back to you and we can chat about whatever so i'm always open to meet people so twitter is the best way for sure um and then classroom q is just the letter q at the end uh dot com and then my edtech bundle.com coming out summer 2021 so check that out too absolutely we can't we can't wait to check those out and we will link to everything in our show notes page which is always can be found at power and in this case, it'll be slash show 25. So we'll have links to Kyle's uh, social media handles. Um, I've been jotting down some notes on topics and names and articles to to link to in there as well. And we will definitely link to Classroom Q and, and my EdTech bundle as well. So Kyle, I, I I had a blast. I think I could have spent another three hours on, on uh, flipped learning and UDL. But, um, you know, this conversation, I said to you before, before we started filming, which is when we met each other, that... It's an organic conversation. We just kind of let it take it where the wind blows. And, and I don't think either of us foresaw that conversation happening, but I think it was really worthwhile. I think a lot of teachers will get a lot of out of that with some key instructional strategies they can use or just ideas to start researching and, and reading on their own. So I appreciate that um, and and appreciate your time. And, and uh, your district is, I think, missing out on, on a, a benefit of having you as a coach, but there is a group of students that are going to be super lucky to be able to be in your classroom and have the experience that you described, because that learning experience, I think will change, change their lives for the good in terms of loving school more and learning how to learn, which is a life skill that they can really benefit from. So they are going to be super lucky come, come August. So thanks again. And Matt, why don't you uh, close shop down here for us? All right. As we power down this episode, Kyle, thank you so much for powering us up. Um, Regardless of when you're listening to it, we have a feeling that you'll be ready to roll and, um, start building some materials, starting to consider uh, what you can do to, to bring the best for the kids each day. We will talk to you guys soon. Be happy, healthy, and well, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.